you everyone for joining us today for our fourth art and design faculty lecture. I'm Lisa Costello, gallery director for the Gertz Gallery at Parkland College, and I'm delighted to have Liza Wynette here today with us to talk about the history of music poster design. Thanks for coming, Liza. Um, it is such an interesting topic and always fascinating to understand the influences that various disciplines have on one another, like, you know, music and design. Wynette is going to examine how culture and technology influenced the look of music posters from Art Nouveau to contemporary times. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our donors and the Gertz Gallery Advisory Board. I'd also like to thank the Parkland College Administration for their support, and of course, Donna Gertz, for whom the gallery is named, and her husband, Fred. I would be remiss not to mention how thankful we are to the Illinois Arts Council, a state agency, for the program support that we receive through grant funding. Uh, Liza Wynette, currently teaches the history of graphic design at Parkland College, and in the past has taught illustration in the visual communication design program. She teaches ceramics for the Champaign Park District as well, and is a successful independent designer and illustrator. Liza, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Great, thanks Lisa, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here, give me one moment. Okay, well, thanks Lisa for um, putting all of these together and all of your hard work and Cindy Smith for all of your tech help. Um, I know the community really appreciates that um, you're bringing this to the public and making it accessible when it's really difficult to get out and um, see these lectures in person. Um, I wanna start by discussing why I chose this topic. Uh, I have a real fondness for music posters because unlike um, most commercial graphic design and illustration, um, which ends up in the garbage shortly after printing, uh, these music posters usually have a really long lifespan and um, outlive their function years after they were printed. And they're just these really amazing cultural artifacts that have a story to tell about the history of music and design in general. Um, so I'm gonna take you on a tour of music posters starting with Art Nouveau in about 1890 and working through contemporary times. Um, this is actually a really big topic and I could create an entire semester's course um, just on the subject. So uh, to keep it under 40 minutes, I had to choose just a small sampling from each era. But if you have an interest in anything that you see, um, I encourage you to explore it um, on your own or ask questions after this lecture. Um, I provided you with quite a few resources and I'll show you how to access those um, towards the end of, end of this presentation. So when, um, first I wanna define kind of music posters um, and what I'm gonna consider a music poster in this lecture. So when we think of music posters, um, often we think of what's called gig posters or posters that are used to advertise rock music. But um, I'm gonna cast a broader net and we're gonna look at posters that advertise venues or festivals. And we're also going to look at posters that were produced just as collectible artifacts. So there are just gonna be a visual representation of the musical experience, but they probably weren't printed to put on the city streets as advertisements. They're just printed as um, like memorabilia or things that you'd buy out of a catalog or online. And um, to end the presentation, I'm also going to show you an example of how um, artists are now pairing their poster designs with digital interactive content on the web. And I think that's pretty exciting. So I'm going to um, start with the Art Nouveau era. And uh, there's a couple of reasons that we start here um, around 1890. Uh, the first is um, the, is the uh, invention of stone lithography. And for the first time, artists could create very large, um, energetic, gestural poster designs. Um, and you're only really limited to the stone that you make the design on. And I'm going to discuss more about how that works in a little bit. Um, but the second reason that it begins in Art Nouveau times is that we have the invention of indoor and outdoor lighting. Now that doesn't seem like such a big deal, 
But before that, if you were a um, member of the community and seen out after dark when there wasn't street lighting, um, you're often accused of very questionable behavior. So the lighting made it possible for everyone to go out and experience nighttime and nightlife. And therefore these nighttime venues and um, events needed to be advertised to the public. Uh, so to understand why posters look the way they do in each era. We kind of need to understand the printing process and te technology that they used. Uh, in Art Nouveau, they primarily used, uh, what I mentioned before is stone lithography. And this is gonna be a really basic um, description of how it works. Um, it's much more complicated than this, but I think you'll, you'll get the idea. So here we have a student, um, contemporary times, do, making a piece of stone, lithogra a stone lithography print. And what she's done is taken the stone that's uh, polished smooth, and she takes a grease pencil and draws her design directly on the stone. And then the stone is inked, and wherever that grease pencil is, the ink is going to stick to it and not stick to the other parts. Then a piece of paper can be placed on top and rolled, and the impression or the, um, the transfer is made. So for a large, colorful poster, um, you need lots of blocks because e each block would have its own color. And the result was these magnificent, huge posters um, that were posted um, in the streets of Paris advertising nighttime entertainment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this poster, um, the uh, Moulin Rouge, was produced by Lautrec. And it doesn't advertise music per se. It's more advertising and give you the impression of music and the type of music that you would experience here. So um, we can, we can um, summarize that the music here is probably very festive and very fun and danceable by uh, showing us these uh, figures in the foreground and middle ground. And there's actually a very funny story ab um, about these individuals. They were real people. They were celebrities. And um, the woman who's dancing the can-can in the middle, her nickname was the glutton because she had a, um, a tendency to, as she's doing the can-can, um, of kicking the hats off of um, the male viewers and then finishing their drinks for them as she made her rounds doing the can-can. Um, rumor has it she was quite intoxicated by the end of the night. And her dancing partner in this poster, his um, nickname was No Bones because his movements were very um, smooth and, and rhythmic. And I thought this is just a really beautiful example of um, the style at the time. So here's another really interesting poster, also by Lautrec. And this is for a different um, nighttime venue. And um, I forgot to mention that both of these posters, uh, a copy of them is a, are um, owned by the Cranert Museum in town. So if you go there just at the right time, the right date, um, you might be able to see these hanging up in the gallery walls. And they're quite magnificent. They're, they're very large. Um, in fact, I'll go back here. It was so large that they could not even print it um, on one big piece of paper. They had it printed on three pieces of paper. And then when they pasted it on the city streets, they would have to carefully line them up and then, then glue them down. Um, so back to this poster, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I find this one really interesting because here we now see the musicians sort of, it's kind of implied. Um, here we have the top of these cellos, which have been abstracted. And we get a little hint of the conductor, but all we see is his arms. And then in the top left-hand corner, her name is Yvette. And she was a very famous performer at this time, but, uh, but her head is cut off. And you know, it's a little weird, but um, I guess she's quite famous. And if you were hip to the scene that you would know who she was because she's very willowy and graceful. And she was known to wear these very long, um, glamorous black gloves. But the main interest are these two folks right here. So this is a performer. Um, she was quite famous at the time, Jane uh, Arville. And next to her is a writer and art critic. And they're the focus here. And everyone would know who she was because she had this interesting hand posture. And she was known for these hats and her hair. And 
what our artist is communicating here is not only can you go see this really fun, like, or interesting performance, but you get to go and hang out with these famous people. So it was really about celebrity culture. And, um, and so that's how they're enticing you to come to this event. So these are the only two posters I'm going to show in Art Nouveau. Um, it was a very short lifespan. Art Nouveau didn't last very long. Uh, the world wars and the rise of modernism um, quickly put an end to this style, but it does have some enduring appeal. I mean, I think most people uh, enjoy looking at Art Nouveau even today. So next we're going to jump across the ocean and a few decades, and we're going to look at some of the earliest rock and country posters in the U.S. And we're also going to take a look at letterpress printing and that technology um, that they use create these really fun, very accessible posters. Um, so letterpress technology had been around for quite a long time already. And part of the reason of its appeal is that once you're set up with a letterpress um, printing shop, it's pretty easy to create lots of copies of these posters um, cheaply and distribute them around, around the city. So these posters would be hung up in public places to advertise musicians visiting the town. And they weren't really at the time meant to be collectible. Um, they're kind of throwaway advertisements, but today they're worth thousands of dollars uh, if you're lucky enough to own one. Letterpress is still used today uh, to create music posters, but now um, because of the cost of printing and paper, they're really only sold as collectible memorabilia. So here's a very contemporary example of letterpress printing. Um, this is courtesy of the Hat Show print shop. And I thought this was a great example of what the before and after um, looks like. So on the right, we have um, our movable pieces of wooden type that have been composed. And in the center, we have a graphic and that graphic could have been carved out of wood or um, created out of metal. But once this is composed, um, you'd either hand ink it or put it through a machine that inked it for you. And then it was sent through a mechanical press and the impression would be made. And there's just something really quite wonderful about holding one of these letterpress prints because you have this usually thicker paper and the feel of the ink, it's a very tactile experience. And depending on the type of press it was sent through, you can often feel like where the, the letters and the graphics are pressed into the paper. There's like a little indention, that's quite nice. So Hat Show Print Shop is still working today. Um, it's still an active, active place that you can go work and take workshops. And here's just a small sample of all of their wooden type and graphics. Um, the place is packed with these sort of things. So here's one of their earliest pieces, um, advertising Elvis Presley coming to town. And here we see the classic black, or excuse me, red, blue, and white motif. And this color palette um, was quite popular. And we can see that the um, impressions um, weren't always crisp and clean, which is kind of the appeal of um, this technology. And this was most likely, this was a metal plate that they would insert in the end craft just for this poster. And it was derived from a photograph. And here's another example um, for uh, Johnny Cash show, which is pretty fun. This one looks like it had seen some, some better days. All right. Um, sorry, I, I feel like I moved through these arrows pretty quickly, but um, it's the only way to make through make it through in 40 minutes. So I'm going to move forward um, a little bit in time, uh, and we're going to look at the Swiss International and Late Modern Period from 1945 to roughly 1970. So as country and rock were gaining mainstream popularity in the U.S., there was this other movement, the Swiss International and Late Modern Movement, that was happening at the same time. So this movement tended to appeal to a much more urban audience, a much more sophisticated audience. I'm going to put that in quotes. Um, and it was especially popular in Europe. Um, modernism often used abstraction in their designs and especially abstraction to visually represent the uh, music being performed. 
So this next move, um, poster series is by Josef Mueller Brockman, and he was a Swiss designer that created a series of posters um, for Musica Viva. And um, he used abstraction to communicate what the music might feel like at that concert um, using these um, little colored squares and cubes and this tilted axis. Um, my interpretation of this is that maybe the music was um, kind of rhythmic and um, kind of lively, but I don't know that for sure, actually. That's just my interpretation. And I kind of encourage you to come up with your own idea of what this music might have been like. And here is another one um, from the same series. Um, this one uses uh, large circles and is even simpler. So for myself, I kind of feel like maybe that this poster is, um, you know, it, it has music that's maybe less rhythmic, is more smooth, but maybe builds over time. So, and I also like to mention that, um, you know, if you're familiar with the elements and principles of design or music theory, that they often share the same language. So you can use the words like um, tone and rhythm, um, you know, to describe both visual and auditory um, communication, which I think is really interesting. All right, now we're gonna jump to 1960s psychedelic art. Um, and this is probably the most colorful and eccentric movement we're gonna look at uh, this evening. And it's really the beginning of what we call the gig poster design um, phenomena. And uh, the psychedelic movement really started in San Francisco in the end of 1960-ish. And the music posters created at this time were part of the hippie um, counterculture movement. And these posters are really meant to mimic the experience of tripping out on psychedelic drugs, which were um, still legal at that time. Uh, and they were really quite interesting and they were at, from the get-go, not really meant to be posted on the city streets, although that did happen occasionally. They were created by fans of the music who often were designers or illustrators who just wanted to be a part of the scene. And this is the way that they can contribute to that scene. Um, these posters, you could pick them up at record shops. And sometimes um, at the end of a show, they would give away um, posters, especially at the Fillmore Theater to advertise the next show. Um, and, you know, sometimes they were on the, on the city streets, but not very often. The majority of these posters were created with a technique called um, silkscreen printing. And it was incredibly affordable and fairly easy to use with a little practice. So I'm going to oversimplify this, um, but I think you'll get the idea of how it works. So a designer came up with their design and they took a stretched piece of silk and they pre um, coated it with a light sensitive emulsion. And then um, they burned in their design uh, and then all that was left, um, or excuse me, where their design was, um, there is now open silk, which you could press ink into. Um, so on this example, you can see where it's light pink, um, that's where there's no emulsion and where it's dark pink, the emulsion still exists. And then you could ink the screen and push the ink through the screen um, with like a scraper and um, transfer the ink onto paper or like a t-shirt. Now that's a gross oversimplification, um, but I think you get the idea. And, um, you know, these kits were pretty easy for them, these designers to pick up. Um, so this was the, the medium of their choice. Um, the first example I want to show is by Bonnie McLean. And I want to start with this one because there were a lot of women working in psychedelic poster design, but they get very little credit for their work. So I wanted to give a shout out to her. Um, in her poster, you see all of the classic um, motifs of psychedelic poster design. Um, you see these really neat patterns that were actually adopted from Art Nouveau era. And uh, in fact, some historians refer to psychedelic design as the Art Nouveau revival. And then we have these really interesting, uh, this really interesting type, 
interesting typography that is almost illegible and is kind of crammed into this form and given this sort of wavy type of feel. And there's um, women. So women were often um, used as a subject matter in this poster. And this was commissioned actually by Bill Graham, who owned the Fillmore and had um, brought in musicians like, um, oh, excuse me, like uh, the Grateful Dead and um, those sort of folks. And here's a very famous poster by Wes Wilson. Um, and here we see, again, kind of some Art Nouveau-inspired um, uh, design. Um, this peacock was a really popular motif in both Art Nouveau and the arts and crafts movement. So they brought that back. And we also see kind of this fun hand-generated psychedelic type. And what's most What's noteworthy about this is we're starting to see um, vibrating colors, uh, which was used a lot by different designers um, during this era because it gave you a sense of kind of like tripping out. And here's a work by Victor Moscoso. And he's a really interesting uh, character. If you have a chance to check out one of his lectures, um, I definitely recommend it online. Um, he was the only designer of this era that I'm aware of that was formally trained. So he actually went to Yale and he took all of the things that he learned at Yale in his art and design courses and turned them upside down. He purposely broke the rules and because he was classically trained, he knew how to break them really, really well. Um, so he took colors that you weren't supposed to combine together and, and did, and it created this vibrating sort of effect. Um, and his text tended to be um, quite illegible, but this one is, is actually better than a lot of them. So the idea was that if you saw this on the city streets and you didn't get it, or let's say you couldn't read the type, um, the idea was that maybe you're not hip enough to actually go to these concerts. So it repelled those people that they didn't want there, but certainly attract the people that they did. And I want to leave this era with this classic Grateful Dead poster um, by Mouse. So uh, there's a really, Stanley Mouse is a really interesting character. Um, people call him Mouse, um, not only is his last name, but um, he kind of had this mousy, quiet toward, sort of attitude about things. And the story goes is when he was commissioned to create this poster, um, he didn't know where to start. So he went to the basement of the library and started flipping through a bunch of old books and found this etching of a skeleton with flowers. And he copied it, colored it, put it into um, this hand generated frame and printed it. And now it is a classic. And when we think of, think of Grateful Dead, this is usually the image that comes to most people's minds. So like Art Nouveau, um, this movement was really short. Um, the style was quickly appropriated by mass marketing and lost its appeal with the founders. So they used psychedelic design, um, like a watered down friendly version of it to sell anything from movies to like clothing brands. It was kind of silly. Um, along with that, there was the Vietnam War and the assassination of JFK and Martin Luther King. And there was also this kind of migration of youth to San Francisco. And unfortunately, that youth ended up, a lot of them ended up on the streets and addicted to some pretty, um, some pretty hard drugs like heroin. And the whole scene kind of fell apart over time. So I really get a kick out of this era. Um, so I remember the punk and grunge posters from when I was a little bit younger. Um, I remember seeing them on the city streets uh, walking around, but I was, I was a pretty little kid um, at the beginning of this movement. Uh, but I, I do remember them and I kind of have some fond memories for them. So this counterculture um, didn't emerge until around uh, 1975. And the punk and grunge era, um, it's really interesting because they have this DIY aesthetic um, in both their music and in their poster designs. Um, it was definitely an underground music movement that eventually um, grew and became um, an inter inter international movement. Um, 
their posters were handmade, usually by man band members or fans, and they utilized Xerox machines because they were super cheap to use. And they could just go to the copy shop or the basement of the library, make a fun design within a matter of minutes, print out a ton of copies, and then start pasting them up around town. These posters really were not meant to be collectible items. They're just kind of throwaway things. They're meant to be pasted and stapled and adhered to pretty much any surface you could get glue to stick to. And um, a lot of cities found them to be kind of quite a, bit, quite a nuisance after a while because you get these layers of punk posters um, that would build up over time and just coat um, utility poles. Uh, these were raw and often dirty looking. Um, they're edgy. They utilize collage cut up a lot like the Dadaists in Europe years before. Um, and it really is meant to be dark and raw and edgy and in your face, just like the music. The style did evolve and become a little bit more sophisticated towards the end of the punk movement. And um, Here's a work by Art Chantry, who actually had a show at the Gertz Gallery um, a number of years ago. And he took the idea of the punk cut up aesthetic and added some cool um, 1950s clip art and arranged it in this really interesting, playful, but balanced way. And I don't think Art Chantry really meant these to be collectible at the time, but now they're highly sought after um, and quite fun. And just like uh, psychedelic design, um, punk sort of went mainstream and it was appropriated by um, you know, mass marketers. And again, anything to sell like from shoes to movies um, is kind of funny. Um, this poster takes that cut up aesthetic and it uses it to produce a professional um, full-size poster uh, for The Clash, which it does make a certain amount of sense to use this style for The Clash, but it was done by CBS Records um, by a team of designers. So it wasn't by um, some guy in his garage taping stuff together. Now we see the style appropriated by these large corporations. So alongside this underground punk and grunge movement, uh, there was a mainstream style that we call postmodern. Um, a lot of people call it just 80s design or 80s graphic design. And um, these designers were pushing back against um, corporate Swiss typography um, and design, but they were, they had a more playful approach. Um, and it tended to be a lot more uh, consumer friendly than the punk movement was. Now, this movement isn't notable for its contribution for music poster design, but I want to show you um, one exception. So these are posters created by Paula Scher, and if you've taken a graphic history, graphic design history course, um, or even like a beginning graphic design um, studio course, you probably have seen her work. Um, here she's using black and white photography and um, playful positioning of sans serif type to advertise shows for the New York Public Theater. And they're lively and energetic, and it really gives you a sense of what you're going to experience when you go to one of these events. And here she's using kind of that aesthetic of the punk cut up um, style, but uh, it's a lot more approachable and consumer friendly. Like you could hang these on the city streets in New York and um, they'd be accepted pretty much by everyone. Right. Now I want to move to, on to um, the 1990s, and um, a lot of poster enthusiasts call this the resurgence era, because we're going to see um, an explosion of professional quality uh, music poster designs that were using silkscreen um, techniques that were made popular in the 1960s. So posters created in this era um, were quite provocative and they pushed the boundaries um, really of what was socially acceptable in a poster that you may see on the streets. Um, however, unlike the um, Xerox posters of the 80s and that punk era, um, these posters demonstrated 
a high degree of craftsmanship and technical ability. I mean, these are really quite um, like great works of art on um, and hold the round. So, um, excuse me, uh, like psychedelic posters, um, these posters were created by music fans and they usually were not commissioned, but did happen occasionally. Um, the way that they made money on these posters was um, the artist would design them and even print them. And then they would contact the musicians and say, hey, I have all these posters. I'll give you a stack if I can sell the rest outside of your venue. And most of the time they say, yeah, this is pretty cool. And the band would be excited that someone took the time to, to make these posters. And if you could not make it to the event and buy one, let's say outside of the venue, the next best thing is to go to your local music shop and get a little catalog. And the catalog would have in it um, poster designs by all of these different artists. And you would find what you wanted to order and fill out the form in the back and put a check with the form in the mail. And weeks, maybe months later, um, after you completely forgot that you even ordered it, the poster would arrive at your door. Um, so of course, this is before uh, online ordering. Um, I grew up in the 90s. Um, I was a teenager during this time. So I kind of have a fondness for this movement and, um, and, and enjoy it quite a bit. So this artist, um, Coop, uh, he, his work is really interesting. Um, he's inspired by B movie posters and kind of Betty Page style pinups. Um, his work, it was really popular with early grunge bands such as Nirvana and Green Day and Soundgarden. And his style is really provocative. So I wanted to keep this lecture kind of PG-13. Um, which excluded the majority of his work. <laughs> so if you, you find it interesting, um, you should check out his website. Uh, he's still active and, and uh, has some interesting things on there. Um, also a note, he's an avid um, hot rod enthusiast and is well known in the custom culture um, in Los Angeles. Uh, this is the work of Frank Kozik and is one of the most well-known screen printing artists of this, this era. Um, and he worked with a lot of bands um, like uh, Stone Temple Pilots and Red Hot Chili Peppers, of course, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, uh, much like Coop did. And this uh, poster, much to Kozik's chagrin, is probably his most famous work. It was just kind of a quick, like, throwaway poster he did. Um, I think it took him only one afternoon, um, but it, it was his most famous one. But um, collectors say there's just something about this girl and um, like her experience with the music and how it kind of captured this earthy, kind of sexy sort of vibe that was happening in the 90s. Now, Derek's, Derek has kind of stands out from the crowd because he works in a completely different style. Um, he is a professionally trained artist and printmaker that got his start working in um, music poster design. And his work and his gestural quality has more of a, um, an etching type of feel than screen printing, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and one fact about him, I also think it's interesting, is around 2014, uh, he did an interview and he kind of came forward with his battles with um, mental illness and alcoholism. And shortly after that, he created an organization called Acting Out uh, with an exclamation point at the end uh, to help spread awareness um, and offer support for creative people who are suffering from mental illness. So that's kind of his project he's working on right now. Uh, but his work is, outside of music posters is quite noteworthy also. The Louvre in Paris actually owns one of his pieces. All right, um, that brings us to our last era, which is contemporary. And I'm gonna say that starts around the year 2000, of course works through the present. And um, in contemporary music poster design, we see a combination of silk screen printing, offset printing, which is um, you know just similar to the printing technique that makes magazines and newspapers and um, digital. And contemporary music posters um, primarily create 
their works as collectible artifacts or memorabilia. The cost of designing and printing these posters, especially on high quality paper, it just makes it too expensive to um, you know, hang in the city streets. And the internet has almost um, killed the need for posters as an advertising medium. So these are really meant for fans um, you know, to buy and frame and hang on the walls. The style um, ranges widely, but the imagery is often minimalistic and very direct. So here's the work of Tara McPherson, and she really got her start in the 1990s, but uh, most of her work does fall into the contemporary category. And her work is sensual and feminine um, and is quite lovely. And it's also approachable um, for for a, a, a wider audience to appreciate. It doesn't have that edgy quality that we saw in the 90s. Um, and she says that she's really, in her website, she says she's really um, interested in exploring the psychological states of people and uses themes from astronomy and physics and nature to um, create these otherworldly characters. And some of you might know um, Jay Ryan. Uh, he's an Illinois poster designer and does occasionally swing by Champaign-Urbana um, to do a workshop or two, which I think is pretty fun. Uh, he established an, a reputation for um, creating designs completely off the computer, although recently I hear that he's used it as a design tool um, more recently. So his... Um, as he says, his prints aim to attain the same goals as other concert posters, but instead of skulls and hot rods, he uses squirrels and toasters <laughs> and, and very friendly sort of um, motifs to convey this uh, to what the to convey what the music might be about. So it's pretty fun. And um, the last artist that works in traditional poster design that we're gonna look at is Jason Munn. And um, he lives now in Oakland, California. And his minimal, he has this wonderful minimalistic but clever style that um, I personally really enjoy. And these are um, two color silk screens. Uh, if you're familiar with the flight of the Concords, you would, you would kind of get the joke here. Um, and then for the postal service, I thought this was clever. Um, we have, the little tie that holds the envelope um, shut kind of mimics um, old school recording equipment. It's kind of neat. All right, now to end the presentation, I wanted to look at something completely different um, that was hyper contemporary. So this campaign was created by a team of designers for Spotify's celebration of the five year anniversary of its flagship hip hop playlist, Rap Caviar. And um, this campaign was called the Day One Club, and it provides fans with an interactive experience that allows them to discover and prove which artists they've been supporting since the uh, first day the playlist went live. Um, I really enjoy this campaign because it takes poster design and adds different levels of interactivity. So this would be on, um, on the street, but you could also go um, online to Facebook. You could go to Spotify um, and see these cool interactive animated um, promotional pieces. And I have a link um, that I'll share with you at the end of um, this presentation so you can see that for yourself. So this is a really good um, example of how modern or contemporary uh, poster designs can kind of move beyond the printed poster and uh, work within the digital world. All right, well, that's the end of the presentation. Um, thanks so much everyone for attending on this beautiful Tuesday evening. Um, I'm honored that you took time out of your day to join me and um, if you're curious about uh, some of the artists that and want additional resources and references um, about this subject, you can head over to my website. It's just lizawinette.com forward slash learn. And it will look something like this. Um, so I have links to um, all of the uh, designers we looked at today and then a few other goodies if you're interested. So, all right, thanks so much. Um,
does anyone have any questions that they, they wish to ask? Okay. I'm trying to give me one moment. I'm kind of reading through the, the Q and A. Uh, oh, this is a good question. How did the size of the posters change over time? Um, that's a really good question. Um, so most of the posters that we looked at were uh, anywhere between 11 to 17 and maybe like 20 by 24. Um, with screen printing, although you can really, you can print really large, you tend to be limited by the width just because it's easier to pull the screen. Um, the posters that we saw that used offset printing, like contemporary printing techniques, um, you can go as as big as you want. And like that last, those last uh, images we saw, those are quite large. Um, and the same with the Art Nouveau posters, they could also go quite large because the technology um, was there to do that. And have you designed any music posters? No, I haven't. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan, but I, I actually have never designed a music poster. Um, I think if, if, I, if I did, I would probably want to start with a bluegrass music poster um, just because uh, there's not a, as many of them out there. They don't get as much attention. So it, it sounds like a challenge to me. Thank you, Liza, for coming and giving such a great talk. It was really interesting. I think all of our attendees probably found it interesting as well. But we thank you all for coming. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>